How many of you missed the big Supreme Court news this past week? No one missed it, because it was all over Facebook, and everyone's on Facebook 24-7, right? Um, you, like someone said this morning, you, you couldn't miss all the rainbows and all that stuff going on. And it, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty bad week from some perspectives. Um, our perspective as Christians, you know, is some interesting developments, and it's kind of a setback culturally. But it's a pretty historic week. You know, for, for something like this to happen, because this decision got ran all the way up to the Supreme Court. There's no more place to go with it. So no matter what our opinion is on whether this was a constitutional decision or not, the, the highest court in the land has ruled on it, and there's, we're stuck. We're stuck with this. So how do we look at this in light of that? And this sermon is not going to be on, on gay marriage, but, you know, when that news hit, which was, I think, Friday, something like that, um, I already had my topic lined up and everything, and at first I thought, oh, great, talking about this subject, and, I, and it's not really in line with what I was talking about. Then as, the more I started thinking about it, the more I realized how, how much it is in line with what I'm going to be talking about, which is working for the king. As Christians, working for the king, while we're working for other people, businesses, governments, and, and other secular pursuits, how do we do that? And, and, I, and so it, it fits perfectly, actually, because I think in, in the Christian world, you know, there's all, all kinds of different responses that we're seeing. Politicians running for cover and uh, Christian groups cowering in defeat. We feel kind of defeated by this, by this um, uh, ruling or, or this screaming hysterically on the streets saying, how could this happen? How could marriage, which was defined by God, be overruled by 12 guys in black robes. Um, so how did this happen? Were Christians just asleep for the last 50 years, 500, 500 years, 100 years? Uh, what happened to cause this to happen? How do we get so disengaged with the culture? And maybe it was in kind of a, you know self-righteous indignation, like, you know, I don't want to be involved in all that stuff, all that politics stuff, right? And so we stay out of it. Um, but maybe kind of we ceded too much ground, and maybe we decided not to get too political because we don't want to, you know, maybe, um, you know, get on shaky ground with the IRS, or we want to make sure that we don't make enemies in high places, and so we want to kind of soften our words and, and maybe not be quite so vocal about the things that we believe that are coming straight from the Scriptures. Um, and all those things run through my mind, and those all may be reasonable goals, but are they biblical um, in retrospect, sometimes, you know, I look back on, on history and I think, you know, maybe cultural historians are going to um, paint a picture of this episode in, in Christian history as one of kind of Christian retreat, where we kind of retreat. And you say, well, how, you know, how, that can't be because we were out there lobbying, we were out there passing laws and, and, um, and getting propositions in California passed and they got defeated. Um, and all these things that we were out there doing. You know, we were, out, we were doing what we should have been doing. We were activists. We were out there um, pushing. We even clicked like on all those neat memes on Facebook, right, as if that does anything. Um, and we forwarded all those emails from our friends to everyone else that we know. And all those things may have some influence. I'm not saying that the, it's bad to like on face, Facebook or forward those emails that, that, um, to, to everyone that we know. It, but obviously that wasn't enough. It didn't do the trick. Um, and here we are. We're here with a, a court decision that attempts to redefine marriage. So, again, I'm, I promise you this is not a sermon on gay marriage, um, but it does make a good introduction for what I want to talk about because um, I think we're in a situation that, um, that these two topics are closely related in the way that I think what happened Friday happened because Christians didn't take seriously this idea of working for the king actively working for the king while we're working in all of our other pursuits and infusing our passion for Christ in everything that we do and taking that to the top in, in whatever way, whatever opportunities that we have to influence. Um, there's a verse that really impacts my thinking on this, and, and it's, I think it's maybe a little bit controversial um, because it's just so out there, and Jesus some, sometimes had a way of doing that. He was out there. Um, and he kind of shook people up. But I'm going to read from Matthew 10, 16 through 19. And this is when Jesus was sending out the 12 disciples. Um, and at this point, I think it's around this time when they became his 12 apostles. They were now on a mission. They were now his messengers. So they were followers, disciples, students. 
Um, and now they're his messengers. He's t- they're taking the message to the streets. And he says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. And here's the catcher. Therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you'll be brought before governments and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. But that first part, therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. And I think what he's telling them is that if they wanted to be successful at turning the world upside down for Christ, they would need to be savvy about it, smart about it. Yes, season your words with grace. Um, be, be loving, be gentle, be kind, but don't roll over and don't give up the fight. Be savvy, be smart about where, what influence we bring to bear on the world around us and be, and be willing to take our influence to higher and higher places as, as we have that opportunity. As God puts those opportunities in front of us, take them. Don't shy away from them because that's, well, that's just someone else's job. I don't want to get involved in that. I, you know, I don't, want to, I don't want to risk you know, my boss thinking I'm a little bit overly political. Or I, don't, I don't want to risk maybe coming off as someone who's biased on this subject. Well, you know, sometimes it's okay to be biased, isn't it? I want to take you back to a story from my high school years, and, and I've shared maybe this one with some people before, but it's really impacted me because, you know, it's, it's kind of an episode I was kind of ashamed of um, in my high school years because I was a Christian in name. I, I, um, I believed. I was a believer. I believed the Bible was true. Um, and um, there's this other guy. And Christianity, by the way, was not real well talked about in my high school, at least, at that time. This is back in the 80s. Okay? And, um, and yet there was a growing, a very small but growing Christian music movement. Um, remember Amy Grant? It's like the first one. Um, and a few others. Well, they're not real well, you know, received by the secular, you know, world. But, but um, there's this one guy in, in my school. His name is Todd Harper. No relation. Um, and he was openly Christian. And it made no qualms about the fact that he was interested in Christian music and uh, listened to it. And, and he'd pray at lunch and stuff like that. And you know, he wasn't, he wasn't the outsider. He wasn't the inside in the group, in the in-group necessarily, but he wasn't, like, shunned for it. And, and all this time, I'm, I kind of felt guilty, you know, because he was way more vocal about his faith than I ever was. I kind of kept to myself, and I was kind of an introvert and um, wasn't willing to come right out and say what I felt about certain things. And, um, and now look at me. So um, <laughs> you can't, can't keep me quiet on some things. Um, but I, I kept at that time pretty silent about about my faith, and um, and I would listen to secular music even though I knew it was you know pretty much artistically and lyrically trash. Um, but here, this guy Todd was he was working for the king, and he was proclaiming his allegiance to the king much more vocally than I was. I'm kind of ashamed of that, but it had an impact on me. This, these many years later, that has an impact on me. Um, I might just reach out to him sometime and find him on Facebook and tell him that. But the question is, do we engage or not with our culture? Um, and there are actually some who don't think Christians should engage with the culture. And, and if you think about it, you know, it seems like a no-brainer at first. Oh, of course we've got to engage with the culture. We, we need to influence it. We need to impact the culture. But then there's other times that come up that you, we always hear these arguments, you know, well, this isn't the time, or maybe it would be better if we just kind of keep this one under the radar, or... Um, you know, there, there was a time in history, remember monasteries, you know, centuries ago, where they thought that Christianity, righteousness, was about going off and secluding yourself from society and that you would be more righteous if you just got away from it all and just had a relationship, a vertical relationship. Um, and I, I think we're a little bit older and wiser now in human history realizing that Christianity is much more horizontal, too. We have to relate to each other and bring each other into that vertical relationship with God. We can't do that in a monastery. Um, so I remember the debates back in the 80s among Christians about whether we should even engage with the culture in terms of, like, Christian music. That was a new thing back then, you know, and, and Amy Grant was kind of going out there, going from the church into a recording contract and, um, and actually getting money for that. Um, that was a new thing. And I remember hearing all these debates, you know, we're just lowering our standards in order to fit in. You know, we're... We're just kind of, you know, soft-pedaling the gospel and doing the gospel for profit and, 
we're watering it down, and you, well, that 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 singer doesn't say anything about baptism, and we could all find all kinds of things. Well, are those artists even really Christians? You know, we could find all sorts of things to to level at these people um, that were out there doing what I should have been doing way back then. Um, but now, as I raised my family to listen to largely Christian music growing up. Uh, for better or for worse, sometimes you know they may not like me for that, but um, it struck me a while back that I did that largely on the backs of people who are much braver than me, who are willing to go out there and impact the culture, who are willing to go out there and encourage their sons and daughters to get into a field that's a hard field to get into and make their way into a place where they could get their music of grace and inspiration and Jesus into a much broader audience. And we take that for granted. Um, and that's not just in the music arena. There's film and, and all sorts of other professions. Um, but they made that decision to do that as if they were working for the king, didn't they? And so they decided to impact the culture um, and go against the grain on that. And now look at the booming Christian music industry. We take that for granted. You know, we flip on Air One or KTSY or you know, download stuff on iTunes, and we take it for granted. We walk into Walmart, and we hear third day and think nothing of it. But that took a long time to get to that point. It took people who are courageous enough to say, I want to influence the culture. I'm going to, I'm going to be okay going into the lion's den and, and doing that, going into the music business, which is a dog-eat-dog, horrible business for some people, and I'm going to succeed in it, and I'm going to do it with a vision, and I'm going to get my message across. Um, and the other day I watched my favorite movie channel, Hallmark, um, and with my lovely wife. And the title of the movie and the theme song were both um, based on the lyrics of a Christian music song. I don't remember which one it was now, but it, was, it struck me as, wow, this is pretty impactful. And someone, some screenwriter, Christian, obviously, took it to the top. They took their passion and, and took their vision for sharing Christ and said, let's write a script. Let's write, it, let's write a screenplay and, and turn it into and pitch it to Hallmark. And they got it done. And it happened. And look, there's this movie title with the name of a very popular Christian worship song that we, you know, we sing all the time. Um, it's pretty powerful. And yet going way back again to my high school days, I'm ashamed to say that I was silent and intentionally unengaged. Um, I, I wasn't working for the king. So what happens when we don't engage? Um, and, and I hope that we're not at a place in society where we kind of need to make the case that we should engage with the culture. But maybe I'm wrong, but maybe that's exactly the conversation we do need to have, is that we need to constantly may, maybe make that case to remind ourselves and encourage ourselves and encourage our kids to take up the cause of Christ in the pursuit of whatever field that, they are, that, that God has called them into, to encourage them to infuse that with Christ at all levels and at the highest level and to be the top of their profession with a vision for impacting the world for Christ. So maybe we do need to have that conversation. Maybe we do need to make that case a little bit more powerfully. Because after all, I think there's still a lot of people who um, steer clear of any political office because that's just too you know, dirty for Christians. There's too many liars and crooks in politics, right? Um, we don't want to get involved in that because that's, that's beneath us. And yet, what happens when we don't get involved in politics? This is what happens, isn't it? We end up with rulings like this. What happens when we don't encourage our Christian on-fire kids to enter law school on fire for the Lord with a a mission and a vision for doing this for the Lord? This is what happens, isn't it? We end up with a Supreme Court that's wishy-washy and makes horrible law. Um, so this is what happens when we concede the, to the enemy. When we say, yeah, the battle's up to the Lord, but I don't really need to do anything either. And, and you don't know, the battle, it does belong to the Lord, and that's why I need to be involved and engaged with it, because I'm, I'm on the side of the Lord. Um, and, that, and this is what happens. Um, I think the proper way to look at what happened on Friday is, just to, is not to wring our hands and run from that battle, but to re-engage with it. Um, and not in an, in an angry, you know, um, mean-spirited way. Um, we need to talk about our, our biblical values, and we need to fall on our knees in prayer um, and, and 
appeal to God to be able to change our nation again, change our hearts to be more bold and persuasive and willing to exert our influence on society in a loving and compassionate way. Um, so don't get me wrong, we're not in a battle against the gays. Um, I think not in the slightest. The biblical approach to this segment of the population, if you look in 1 Corinthians, is to love the sinner and hate the sin. Did you know that, much, that some of the people in the church of Corinth were from that lifestyle? That was a very common lifestyle back then. And he says, such were some of you. If you read in 1 Corinthians, um, he says, such were some of you. Now, he didn't just accept the men and say, hey, come as you are, and you're all good as you are. No, he, he taught them. He, he explained that that's not how we live. We, we honor ourselves, and we, we, we get into committed relationships with a husband and a wife. Um, that, mess, that, that marriage isn't anything we want it to be. Um, and so the proper way to think about this, I think, is to realize that men can say that black and white, black is white and that white is black um, all they want. Laws can be written you know, and defended all the way up to the Supreme Court uh, saying that marriage is between a man and a woman or that marriage is between a man and a man or three women or a man and a dog, for that matter. People can do whatever they want, but that doesn't change the fact of what marriage is. Marriage is still what God said it is. And so we can change the labels all we want. Men can try to you know, come in as politicians or as, as lawyers or as judges and change that. But it doesn't really change, does it? Marriage is always marriage. And it's because God instituted it in the chapter, in second chapter of Genesis. That is what marriage is. It will always be that. So shuffling labels for political correctness doesn't do any, doesn't make a difference to us as Christians. It makes a difference in our ability to change the culture because our voices start getting lost. And that's where I think we need to re-exert our influence in society is to um, step up our, our skill level at getting our voices heard um, and having that kind of influence. The job I think we have is to teach our kids and encourage each other. And, um, and, and by doing that, um, exert our influence on the culture and recognize the beauty of how God designed marriage to be. Um, and it's exactly that influence that, that I think I'm talking about here when I say let's work for the king. So hopefully we're all on board with the fact that we ought to exert our influence on the culture. Um, we have every right to do that, by the way. Sometimes I think we shy away from it. We think you know, Christians are sometimes a little timid about our message. And we, you know, we shy away from that. And we think, well, you know, they have more right to speak because they're in a public place. Who am I? I'm just, I'm just the little guy. No, we have, a, we have a voice. We have something powerful to say. And it's something that resonates with human nature. We can talk about this and be bold about it if we read up and, and encourage each other to, to stay on message about what this is all about. Um, we don't need to be timid. That doesn't mean we have to be too brash and speak harshly about people that God loves either um you know these people are people that jesus the exact people that jesus came to talk to um and you know we're all sinners we're all equal in that um we have evidence you know, like i said of of the homosexual lifestyle being part of the the culture in the first century this isn't a new thing it was part of the pagan worship you know to their deities um but there's no question that we ought to seek influence in the culture the real question is how do we do that? How do we, how do we have that influence in the culture? So let's talk about that. I think we need a model for how we actually go about exerting influence in the culture. Because it, what does that look like? We're all in different places in the, in the world. We have different positions and jobs. Um, some of us are homemakers. You know, some of us um, are retired. Um, some maybe work for the government. Some maybe uh, work for a big, successful, uh, powerful company. Others, you know, maybe self-employed. Everyone's in a different place. But every single one of us has an ability to influence someone or something in the cause of Christ. Um, so what model do we use to do that? And I, and I think that's where, you know, something has been on my heart for quite some time now. And I've talked about this story from the Bible for a while. Um, and this sermon is kind of the culmination of that thought brewing in the back of my head. Um, and so I want to remind you of a story that we all know. We all probably heard it in Sunday school. Um, and I want to, want to look at the story of Daniel. And we all, what's, the verse, what's the first story of Daniel that comes to mind when we think of Daniel? Daniel and the lion's den, right? 
we think, yeah, it's a story of bravery and standing up to the, to the powers that be. Kind of a, a revolutionary look at, at, um, at his faith. And that's all great, but, but there's a lot more of the story that maybe we didn't talk about as much in Sunday school. And that's the context of it's really, truly an amazing story when you think about it. It, it blows my mind to think about the application the many, many applications of that story of Daniel to our life today. It's extremely applicable, especially in this climate right now. Um, So let me just take you briefly. I'm not a historian here, so, but, so, um, but let's go back to about 720 B.C., and this is when Israel conquered Assyria, and at that point, Israel ceased to exist. So Israel is off the map. Remember, we have a divided kingdom. We got Israel and Judah, and Israel gets conquered by Assyria. They're gone. Um, and so that leaves the kingdom of Judah, but at this point, Judah was weakened, heavily weakened. And um, remember when the, uh, I want to say it was Hezekiah, um, invited in the king of Babylon to come look at the, te- the temple treasures, said, hey, look at all this stuff here that my God has for us. Well, the king of Babylon got that in his head, and he goes, I'm coming back for that someday. So that's exactly what happened. So, so, the king, so Judah eventually fell to to uh, to Babylon. Um, actually, before that, it was under the control of Pharaoh, Pharaoh Necho, and so you know Judah is basically under this under the rule of all these foreign powers. Um, but eventually, you know, Babylon comes along, Nebuchadnezzar comes along, and he kind of takes the whole cake. You know, it's a winner takes all. So he takes both, basically conquers the whole land, and he's got under his authority both Judah and Israel at this point. Um, so he does what all Babylonian kings did, and he went out and he, he brought the best and the brightest from the land and brought them back to Babylon and, and siphoned off their brain trust. Um, and so who ended up in that pool of talent? Remember? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel. So four out of probably about 10,000 people ended up back in Babylon, captured by the enemy of God's people. So think about this for a minute. You have Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego working for the enemy of God's people, with God's blessing, by the way. So how powerful is that when we look at our ability or our interest in engaging with the culture around us? We're not working for the enemy. We're working for, you know, at at best or at worst, a secular government. At best, maybe a government that was set up to have some religious foundation to it, some principles, some some faith principles behind it. Um, but we're not working for, you know, the enemy of God's people in this culture, even at even worst case scenario. Um, to really understand this, just you need to appreciate the fact that they were they were captives. You know, they were they were um, working literally for the people that had come and crushed their country. That would be like. In modern terms, it would be like Microsoft going to Apple and forcing its smartest engineers uh, to go work for Microsoft. I mean, it, working for the enemy right there. <laughs> but um, how many times have we, we heard it said, and I know I've said it, you know, I could never work, you know, I could never do politics because that's just horrible. Um, but this is what happens, you know, what happened on Friday happens when we disengage and say, well, we're not going to do that because we're going to leave that up to the non-Christians because that's what we're saying isn't it? When we say we're not going to get involved in that, I know one, I know one uh, Christian group that goes so far, you know, that leans on the pacifist side of things that won't even carry a gun. And so that will take that to the extreme of not even becoming a police officer. If you take that to its logical ends, what you're saying is, I want all the non-Christians to, to handle law enforcement. How, what kind of sense does that make? So we need to think about these things and kind of retake the, the ideological uh, high ground and get out there and work for the king in these positions. Whatever position that we find ourselves in, whether it's law enforcement or a music career or we have an aspiration to be a filmmaker or we're building things or we're an uh, electrical engineer, whatever it is we're doing, we can find some way to influence someone for the king. And that's what I mean by working for the king. If Daniel could do it working for the enemy, then we can certainly do it working for whoever we're working for, or not working for if you're retired, which is even better. You've got more time on your hands. But, you know, that's why there's so much corruption in government. On both sides of the aisle, by the way, it's, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's a pox on both your houses. 
um, because there's so much corruption and cronyism because um, Christians didn't engage you know, like Daniel did. And if you could imagine getting a job opportunity, like I come up to you and say, hey, I've got an opportunity for you. I've got a job. It's going to really pay well. You're going to have a lot of power. But by the way, you're going to be working for a guy that's got a big ego. In fact, he thinks he's God. He sets up a big image to himself and forces every, everyone to bow down to it every so often. So you might get thrown into a lion's den, um, you know, things like that. But what do you think? You want to take that job? And you're like, yeah, no thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll pass on that one. But that's exactly the position that Daniel was in. But how often would we turn stuff like that down and say, ah, I just don't want to get involved? The risks are too high. I might, I might not be able to get that next advancement and, you know, next time my, my uh, contract comes up or next time my review comes up if they think I'm a little bit too political or, or whatever the case may be. So did he keep his faith in a closet and pretend that he was a pagan? He didn't do that. He was very bold about it. Um, remember the pl- proclamation that went out that no one could pray to anyone but Nebuchadnezzar? Um, he didn't go to the close the window blinds, and he didn't put up a Persian rug. Well, Persia hadn't conquered Babylon yet, so he couldn't put up a Persian rug. He didn't, he didn't put, put up a Babylonian rug over the window so that no one would see him praying to God, did he? No, he, he boldly took a stand, and he suffered the consequences for it. <clears throat> but neither did he go out into the streets and organize rallies either, right? He didn't. He didn't do things that way. So I think he was pretty gentle as a, as, a, as a dove and wise as a serpent at the same time. He understood what his role was and what the opportunities that God had given him, and he wasn't going to blow it. And that's where we need to be. We need to understand that we're all given those kinds of opportunities, and it's our job not to blow it. We want to use those to advance the kingdom in any way that we can. What's really cool about this story, if you noticed in the reading, <clears throat> is it, it is really exciting, actually, because I'd forgotten about this aspect of it. In fact, when I was talking to my wife about it, she said, did he really do that? Um, and I said, yeah, I just read it. Um, but it really jumped out on the page. Um, did you know that Daniel actually used his newly acquired power to appoint Shadrach, Meshach, and Abendo, Abednego to positions of power? Isn't that cool? You think, well, we think, you can think about that cynically. You can say, well, that's just cronyism. You know, that's what all the Republicans and Democrats do in Congress. They just appoint their friends. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about appointing people that are just friends because we're loyal to friends for the sake of friends. I'm talking about strategic, strategically assisting people to have greater influence whenever we can give them that ability. That's exactly what he did. I think he was, he was, um, Wise, uh, wise as a snake on this thing. And he, he put Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in government positions and said, this is your, and you know, he basically advocated to King Nebuchadnezzar, a pagan, and he went along with it because he'd proven himself to be a faithful you know, royal court administrator. So reading that, that again, it just is so powerful. King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel. Okay, King Nebuchadnezzar, this pagan, fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be, pre- be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Daniel, surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all of its wise men. Talk about influence. So now Daniel's got administrative control, policy control, because the, the Babylonians were policy freaks. You know, these guys were like, you know, they had their laws written down, and it was very much policy-oriented. So he's got influence now over all these wise men. That's their, that's their scientists and their philosophers. And then he says, moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. So I just think that's really a, an, an amazing illustration of what we can do as Christians engaging in our culture, um, if we choose to do it. How many of you have been to the Rock and Worship Roadshow? To get back onto music for a minute. Okay. Mercy Me, that guy, the guy made it very successful, right? They, they've been around a long time, had a lot of hit songs, made, uh, I'm sure, a good living for themselves. And he's in the process. This is his giving back. And what he does is he goes around and he brings all these young bands on tour and he introduces them to the masses. Now, whether or not you're into, you know, pop Christian music or not, it doesn't matter. My point is, 
that they're multiplying their message, aren't they? They're taking their influence and saying, here, you guys, I want to train you guys to have this influence. And they're multiplying that, just like Daniel multiplied his message by getting Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out there. Toby Mack does the same thing with his record label. If you'll notice, he's got a lot of, of his mentored ki- um, kids, young adults, doing, doing major hit songs. One of them is in our own Treasure Valley here, Ryan Stevenson. Um, he's played at the Goddard Country Festival, which will be coming up this Thursday. He won't be there. Uh, well, actually, he might be. I'm not sure. But, but he's being mentored by Toby Mack. I mean, um, I'm really excited about the fact that people are willing to go into those fields that I would say, you know, I'm not sure if that's a good business. I'm not sure if we can. I certainly don't have the talent to do it. And yet they're out there making a difference and impacting the culture. Um, so let's bring this a little bit closer to home here. Everyone has some level of influence, whether, in that, whether that's in their job or your social life. Um, everyone, we all have that kind of influence. We just need to find it. We need to, need to be a little bit more gutsy, maybe, about it and actually use it. Um, you know, God has put some opportunities in front of Diana and me both that I don't want to blow those, you know, in terms of foster care. And we want to learn the lessons that are in the story of Daniel here. Um, and maybe we can have some influence on public policy, on church culture regarding foster care, getting more Christians involved. And I mean at all levels. It's pretty exciting because, you know, foster families are needed. Um, recruiting foster families, training foster families. There's opportunities to have an influence on social workers themselves. And I know that I know from working with them, there's some good Christian social workers. Um, and there's a real need for us to engage with those areas of society. Instead of saying, well, you know, social work, that's all, you know, left wing or that's this, that, or the other thing. Or politically, maybe that's not really where I want or it doesn't pay as well. Okay, take all that stuff if you want. But if, that, if your passion is working with people and if you've got an opportunity to do that and you can do that with a heart for the Lord, maybe that's a great thing. Um, and so maybe you have a good relationship with a manager or an executive or a fellow employee, and maybe these people just desperately need to hear the gospel. Maybe that's what it's all about. It's just a personal connection, and that's okay too. We just need to take those opportunities and work, do our work for the king and don't pass up on those opportunities. There's all kinds of more uh, examples than just Daniel, just to throw a couple out there. Um, you know, Esther, same idea. She used her position of, of influence on the king to save her people um, and to rout out a bad guy in the process that was about to destroy her people. Joseph is another great example, very much like the story of Daniel. Joseph, like Daniel so many years later, started his, his influential, influential career as a captive. He was a slave. Um, he was sold into slavery by his brothers, but God had bigger plans for him than that. Um, and you, you say, well, God doesn't have that kind of a plan for me. You know, that's I'm not there to save the children of Israel by going into the land of Egypt and becoming an overseer of many people. And the more you talk, the more you realize, well, maybe, maybe you do have that kind of a role. Maybe there is something like that coming up. And maybe not exactly like that, but maybe there's something that you need to be thinking about now that's going to be happening 10 years from now. And God wants you in that place to be able to accomplish that. Maybe. But where's our faith? We think that oh, God isn't going to do that with me. I'm, I'm just, you know, Aaron. I don't, I don't have a voice. I'll let my brother talk. Really? Maybe we need to be the ones out there talking a little bit more. Because maybe when we don't, what we got on Friday is what happens, right? So I think, um, I think we just need to engage and maybe make our faith a little bit less ivory tower. It's something that we talk about maybe less on Sunday morning and more every other day of the week, and get out there and make it real and, and put it to work. The apostles changed the world. They turned it upside down. And do we see that kind of enthusiasm now for Christianity? You know, sometimes we feel, you know, oh, we're just, we're the minority. We're not the minority. If you look at the polls, you know, Christ, this is still a Christian nation. Now, maybe Christianity is, like I like to say, an inch deep and a mile wide. It's not a lot of depth to it, but we're still, still in numbers, are nominally a Christian nation. But we've kind of pulled back out of academia and out of politics and out of all these high-level areas of influence. We said, ah, we're not really interested in that. That's for the for people other than me, and this is what we get. Um, but the apostles changed the world, and there's pure evil. I'm telling you, there's pure evil uh, in the world right now that needs to be dealt with. 
um, in the form of Islam and ISIS is on the rise. They're killing innocent men, women, and children, uh, raping and enslaving young girls, slaughtering kids in front of their parents. Um, and you don't think the forces of evil are using every bit of influence they can muster? Of course they are. They're doing everything they can to get people of in influential positions in our country to bring that kind of theology, because that's what it is, a theology, into our nation. Um, and we don't need to fight back with angry rhetoric and, and what all. We need to be loving and kind, but firm and wise and shrewd as a serpent, gentle as a dove. So we need to be that influence and work for the king. Um, I'm going to have us do that, like we watched that video, and it was call to fall is what they're calling it. It's a, a campaign to really remind the churches, remind each of us in the churches to pray for our nation. And, and we're going we're gonna to do that. We're going to pray for our nation um, and, and pray that we can, be, we can see the opportunities that are in front of us because we all have them and see what those opportunities are for us to be an influence. I'm going to put a book in the library that I have a couple of them now. I'm not sure how I got two, but it's a book called In But Not Of. Um, in the World But Not Of the World, right? And, and it's a guide to Christian ambition and the desire to influence the world by a guy named Hugh Hewitt. So, any of you heard of Hugh Hewitt? Not many. <laughs> he was a talk show host. is still a talk show host. He's a pretty influential guy in Washington circles. Um, he's a, what you'd call a thought leader. But it's a good book um, for those, you know, maybe younger that are interested in, in becoming people of greater influence to have an influence on our culture. Um, and, and so I'm going to put this in the library if anyone's interested in it. It's a short read. It's a really good one. I don't necessarily agree with every single thing that he says in terms of what you need to do, but it's a, it's a really inspiring little book. And I think we should all be interested in that theme of in but not of we are in the world but we're not of the world and they can make whatever laws that they want about redefining marriage and it's not going to change the real definition of marriage is it it's still the same it's exactly like it was however many thousands of years ago in genesis chapter 2 marriage is still between a man and a woman and people can change, try to change that all they want but our job is to be um, agents of influence in our culture, lovingly and compassionately. So let's, let's, um, I'm going to, if you guys want to, to go down on your knees in prayer, you're welcome to, you don't have to, I don't want to make anyone uncomfortable, um, or if you just physically can't do that, that's fine, um, so I'm just going to kneel down here, and we're going to pray for our nation, and then we're going to have a closing song. I think I can safely go back to this mic here. So let's pray. Dear God, we come to you before you at this time. We want to just come on our knees to you and thanks for the opportunity that we have to live in this free country. And we know that there are many things that have happened in recent years, not just, not just what happened Friday, but recent decades, as our culture has in some ways slipped backwards in, in falling away from you. And I pray that you would give us the ability to see, to find our voice, to, to speak out lovingly and compassionately, but, but wisely and, um, and smartly and, and, and just be savvy about our um, influences and, and utilize them to the best of our abilities to, for the kingdom. Lord, help us to work for the king and knowing that you are the king and that whatever other positions that we work for in life are incidental, that whatever our job is in, in our, our lives, how we support ourselves, uh, we can influence people there for the kingdom just as we can influence our, our social circles as well. I pray that you would help us to seek you with all of our heart and have a heart of repentance and um, a heart of, of seeking ways to be more bold. Help us to, to do that and to take that call seriously, to take back our nation's uh, conversation on faith. And um, I just want to pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.